man. I'm a leader on this team and from defense all the way up. And I feel like if I go the wrong way, if I sway the team a certain way, it's going to go downhill. You know, if they, if one of the best players is all of a sudden not a part of what the true mission of the goal of us to do is, I feel like that we won't have as much success. And I had to put that, had to put myself back for a second and think about the team for once and for for a part of what we're doing and I just kind of just put it back and just focus on this season and focus on what's going on and focus on my teammates to make sure that we are back to Houston, Texas and I think that's what's important. For Super Bowl 51. I want to tell you a football memory of you I have. After the Super Bowl against the Patriots the most memorable Super Bowl I think there ever was. Maybe not the greatest one for you guys but (laughs) after that Super Bowl The New England Patriots allowed NFL Films to show their preparation for the Super Bowl. And they have a a researcher, a guy who has been with Bill Belichick forever. It's a guy named Ernie Adams. And Ernie Adams came on this show, and two or three times he just said, our whole goal in this game is to stop Michael Bennett. If we stop Michael Bennett, we'll win the game. And I'm paraphrasing him. I don't know that he said exactly that. They were... I'm not saying maniacally concerned, but they were hugely concerned. And yet, when you hear about the Seattle Seahawks, you hear about Richard Sherman or Cam Chancellor or Earl Thomas or Russell Wilson or or Marshawn Lynch until this year. And I wonder if you get a sense that maybe you're not quite as appreciated (laughs) by the public and maybe even by sort of the so-called experts as you think you should be. No, yeah, of course. I mean, I feel like if you look at the way that the game is played and how I approach the game, I approach the game like a warrior. Like, I play every position from left to right, nose tackle. I spend, I spend 62% of the game inside. That's more than any defensive end in the NFL right now. So, you know, it's one of those things where I feel like people don't appreciate the things that I do and how I – how I play great run defense. I think people are used to a defensive end doing, being good at everything that he does on the field. I used to a guy either being a good pass rusher or a guy being a good run stopper. And I'm doing both. You know, every play I line up and I dominate from three technique to nose to end. And I think a lot of the opponents, my opponents, they recognize that. But I think a lot of times the fans, and I think it's just the team that I'm on. There's so many great players that I think sometimes people overlook the things that we do. And that's okay because at the end of the day, we, it's all about the W's. And I know the type of player that I am. I, and I know that if I keep doing what I'm going to do and then keep dominating the way I am, it'll take care of itself. And I can't worry about them too much because at the end of the day, they don't pay my bills. <laughs> We're with Michael Bennett in Renton, Washington, just outside Seattle at the Seahawks training facility. So, Michael, you have been fairly outspoken on a number of issues, but one of them that interests me is – the players union, you know, the NFLPA, uh, you have been outspoken in thinking that it should be stronger, it should be more strident, and particularly the stars of the game should be more strident and stand up more for players' rights. Explain. Well, the whole idea of of a players' union is supposed to be, everybody's supposed to be a part of it. We all sign this paper. We all say that we love the shield. But sometimes I think that players forget that there's, there's two different, there's a league and then there's the players. And sometimes players think that they're a part of the league when they're really not. They're a part of the players association. And they're a part of what happens next to the players behind them. And I think that we haven't done enough. I think the guys before us, they done more than this year from Franco Harris to all these guys, you know, these guys that stood up and they, and they made things change. And we are, we are part of the new generation and people behind us, we need to make a change. There's no reason why our contracts aren't guaranteed. The only reason our contracts aren't guaranteed is because enough of us haven't said enough. And once we start saying enough, then things will change. And I think with the Players Association, I just think that I'm a part of the Players Association and the whole idea of it is pretty cool. But then once we get there, I just think we're not all on the same page of what we want. I think sometimes players are thinking what's good for the NFL, not what's good for the players. And I think when we're part of the Players Association, what's important is the players, what happens to the players, what, it's gonna, what kind of money we're going to make, and how we're going to take care of the players. And I think we just haven't done a great job. I think that, first of all, one thing that I think is wrong with the Players Association, and I've said it this is several times on anything I've been a part of, is that I don't think there's enough outside people that are a part of the Players Association. And I'm, when I say that, I say that, if you look at Starbucks, you look at Google, or you look at any other great organization that's carrying a lump sum of money, they look for people that's been a part of CEOs. So why can't we find people that's done something great 
outside of the NFL? Why does it have to be a player that's a part of the head of the association? Why can't somebody used to work at Microsoft that ran Microsoft for years? We go get them and we start thinking differently. Our thought process is that we are workers and not that we are owners. And really, we own everything that goes on to NFL. The way that people wear their clothes, they do it because of the players. They wear the jersey because of the players. There's three or four teams that people love because it's the franchise. And that's the Cowboys and 49ers and Pittsburgh Steelers and maybe the Seahawks. But overall, every team is loved because of the player that wears that jersey. And we have to start taking ownership of that. Like, I feel like I've said this several times in NFL Players Association. I feel like we should be paying a percentage to Nike. Nike shouldn't be paying us a percentage. We should make our own game. Why, why are we getting paid by Madden? There's enough players in the association. We should own everything that comes in. You're Just, saying you should make your own game. We should make our own everything. That's how you make money. Like, why are we still in 2016? How are we still receiving checks? We should be writing the checks. I think that we should own everything. Why drink Gatorade? We can make our own drink. Why wear Nike shoes? We can make our own Nike shoes. It's not really that hard. We make enough money. We have enough players back in this whole thing up that we can really sell whatever we want to sell. But the process has been super easy for us to just sit back and take the dollars. And I think uh, eventually for us to be sustainable, we really have to start taking ownership of what is ours. And what's ours is the products. And how are we going to sell, sell products if there's no players? You think people want to buy Gatorade because it's this, the Cowboys have Gatorade on the thing? They want to drink Gatorade because Des Bryant drinks Gatorade. They want to wear the Michael Jordans because Michael. They want to wear Nikes because LeBron James wears Nikes. That's the reason why they wear the stuff. And and the brands understand that. That's why every generation they in, implement a new athlete that is what ahead of the generation. But we have to start taking ownership of our own things. And I think that's what really is going to have to start changing. And I think it's over time but I think we're really starting to get it when we start, start talking about take it, knocking agent fees down we really start to understand that it's us it's not the people around us we control every facet of this league every facet of what's being sold what's being marketed it goes to the players and I think we really have to understand that Would you ever want to be say, president of the Players Association? Would you ever want to be heavily involved in the Players well, yeah, Association? I wish, when I retire, I want to be way more involved in the Players Association. Right now, I do all the meetings and do all this stuff. And, but I really think, I've said this to all the, to D. Moore Smith, I think he's a, he's a great leader, but I think that he shouldn't be the head of the PA. I think he should be the lawyer of the PA. But I think to really take this league to the next step, instead of trying to fight the NFL and start of trying to stop what they're doing, don't even worry about it. Let's do what China does. Instead of trying to fight the U.S., what do they do? They go create their own products. Why not? Apple is not sustainable in China, nor is Google, nor is Uber. Why? Why would they let anybody else come in their territory and create something great? That doesn't work. And now that's what we have to do in this next generation. Because if we do that, this, it won't matter with the CBA. It won't matter anymore. Why? I was telling somebody, I was like, why, why when they build a stadium, why doesn't the player association have enough? We have enough money. Why can't we buy a part of every stadium that's being built? It doesn't, uh, then every player gets, gives money all the time. They build a new stadium. They're looking for money. Every time they build a new stadium, the players association should have a part in that, not just the owners. It's the MMQB podcast. I don't know about you, but I'm just not crazy about shaving. Ask my wife. I cut the heck out of myself about twice a month. But anyway, nicks and scratches on your face, they're just not fun. And let's face it, razors are really expensive. That is, I thought they were really expensive until I got my first package of razors from Harry's. Harry's blades are high-quality, high-performance German blades crafted by shaving experts, and they feel amazing. It's the best shave I've had in years. The really good part is Harry's offers a high-quality shave that's better for your face and your wallet. It's about half the price of the other brands, and they ship it free right to your front door. Why pay 30 bucks for an 8-pack of blades when you can get them for half that at harrys.com? They have a starter set that's an amazing deal. For $15, you get a razor handle, moisturizing shave cream, and three blades. It's called the Truman. Now comes the best part of all. Go to harrys.com right now, and Harry's will give you $5 off your order if you type in my coupon code, KING. That's K-I-N-G, with your first purchase. You see that? Just by typing in four little letters, your price goes from $15 to $10. It's that easy. That's harrys.com. H A R R Y S dot com and enter the coupon code King K I N G at checkout for five dollars off and start shaving better today. Finishing up with Michael Bennett of the Seattle Seahawks. So I hate to ask you two football questions, but I noted in the story you did recently with ESPN with your brother Martellus 
that you said that getting a sack is sort of like lovemaking. Yeah. So you've had 40 sacks in your career. Yeah. Tell me, what was the most orgasmic moment in those 40 sacks? Hmm. Probably when we played in the NFC Championship against the 49ers and I sacked strip fumble uh, Kaepernick, which another question I don't understand why he's in a quarterback battle because it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> Um, but it was when I sacked Kaepernick and um, they recovered the ball, but it was just the way that the stadium went loud. It felt like everybody was watching me. I felt like Ron Jeremy. <laughs> Ron Jeremy, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> makes his debut on the Peter King podcast. I, I wanted to ask you, too. So this is really a unique team, in my opinion, because it's a team that allows personalities to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, Marshawn Lynch had a huge personality. You have one. Richard Sherman has one. How does that manifest itself in benefiting the team, in your opinion, in the long run? I think that for a while that a lot of coaches felt like a lot of black players or African-American players, they come from this area, and a lot of them don't have fathers, and this coach has to be the man in their life, and it has to show them how to wear their shirt and how to tie a tie and how to, which hand to put the watch on and how to be a father. And then this is idea, and it's just – I think it's an ignorant idea, and I think a lot of coaches fell victim to that. I think a lot of coaches had good coaching schemes, but they felt the, the idea of what they're supposed to do for a player has really messed them up. I think Coach Carroll has really understood that every player is different. He doesn't need to be their daddy. He needs to find out what makes them, what motivates them. And what motivates them is letting them be themselves. That Everybody comes from different areas, and you can't make me be like Jason Witten, and Cliff Averill can't be like Russell Wilson. Everybody's different, and I think Coach Carroll understands that, and he accepts that, and I think that's why he's had so much success in this league because he understands that – let them be them. As long as they do what they're supposed to do, they're not getting in trouble. Who cares of how he wears his shirt? Who cares if his belt is not where he's supposed to be, or the shoes that he's wearing? As long as he's doing his job every Sunday in the way he's supposed to be doing it. Michael Bennett, you're commissioner for a day. You're sitting in Roger Goodell's office. You can change one rule in the NFL. You can do one thing hugely different than is currently done in the NFL. What would you do? I had to take two things. First thing I would do would make every coach, every owner – GM, trainer, scout, I make them go through at least one hit, one contact a day, at least one contact, so they can understand the toll that's put on the athlete's body. You know, sometimes the owners are so far removed that they forget that we're human beings. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, the guy has a torn MCL. Martha Ford is 90 <laughs> years old. She owns the Detroit Lions. She needs to take a hit. <laughs> <laughs> She needs to take a hit or somebody in her family. It doesn't have to be her. It has to be one of her grandsons or uncles or whoever it is. They need to take a hit. The second thing I'll do would be guaranteed contract. There's no reason. You know, and I had this argument with Don Davis of the NFLPA. He sent me this letter. He talks about you know, all you players who talk about the NBA contracts. And I told him, I said, simply, I said, Don, I don't care what you write on this paper. There's no reason. The NBA players, their contracts are super guaranteed. Everything's guaranteed. But for some reason, they don't obtain as many injuries as we do. I said, Don, you know this 100% injury rate. How come our contracts are guaranteed? You can keep saying what you want, but until you guys – we aren't doing a good job in NFLPA or players until every player's contract is guaranteed because we all know the magnitude of what happens to a lot of NFL players. You don't see a lot of NBA players committing suicide or dealing with CTE or dealing with – Lou Gehrig's disease or dealing with any type of these things that come after sports they deal with the knee injuries but most of all the players of the NFL are dealing with crazy head trauma and why shouldn't they have guaranteed contracts you know I said that was going to be it but I do need to ask you one thing you came in here with a green drink and knowing you you live in Hawaii you have a garden at home you eat, drink, you warned me about the plastic bottle that I was drinking water out of when I walked in here so what are you drinking right now? I'm drinking a green smoothie. We've got kale, um, celery, um, broccoli, a little banana, some mango, just all green. What's the liquid? Just water? Just ice. Wow. Yeah. You live a pretty healthy life, don't you? Well, that's the whole thing. I mean, that's what my whole foundation is. I mean, I do everything to help kids understand that there's there's more to what they're eating. And eating is the first way of taking care of who you are and your body. Your body is so important. That's why I do so much with gardening with kids and teaching kids about how to grow their own food, how to exercise as a family, because I truly believe that it starts with the body. Like, if you don't respect your body, how are you supposed to respect everything around you? You don't even treat yourself nice. How are you going to love yourself? What do you want to be known as, a football player or a renaissance man? 
Actually, I, I deal with this. I mean, my brother, we, my brother was talking about this, and I was talking to Cliff Averill about this because I was telling him, like, I feel like as an athlete, you – 